What will it take to stop the destruction of Sudan? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Ma'in Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Hamid Khalafallah and Khuloud Khair. Khuloud Khair is a founding director of Confluence Advisory, a think and do tank in Khartoum that works on policy research. She also hosts and co-produces Spotlight 249, Sudan's first English language political discussion and debate show aimed at young Sudanese. Hamid Khalafalla is a development practitioner, researcher, and policy analyst. He currently works as a program officer for the International Institute of Democracy and Electoral Assistance in Sudan. He is also a non-resident fellow with the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Both my guests are also active members of Sudanese civil society. Hamid Khalafalla and Khuloud Khair, it's a real pleasure to welcome both of you to Connections. Thank you, Mike. Um, Thanks for having us. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to start by um, asking you for an update on the level and intensity of fighting currently going on in Sudan and the extent to which it has spread beyond Khartoum to the rest of the country. We're hearing a lot about armed clashes in West Darfur and elsewhere. Um, Hamid, perhaps if I could uh, start with you. Sure. Uh, so the level of intensity of, of fighting uh, in Khartoum and other places like in Jinena, uh, in West Darfur, uh, and Al Fashir in North Darfur, and so on, uh, has, hasn't gone down. In fact, in so many cases and in so many places, have increased in the last uh, few days. People on ground have been describing the last couple of days uh, as even more, uh, even more intense, uh, despite you know. Uh, the claims that things are calming down and so on. This is not what's happening in the ground. And we have actually been seeing this trend over and over again. Every time, you know, there's a new ceasefire announced or about to be announced and so on, the fighting intensifies uh, on ground. Uh, and I think this could make us question and wonder to how useful uh, these ceasefires are uh, if they are increasing uh, the fighting uh, before they start, and they do not necessarily lead to real cease fire, uh, cease of fire when when they actually start. Uh, yeah, so it, it has been uh, intensified the past few days. And Khulud, does this also reflect what you've been hearing? Uh, absolutely. I mean, as Hamid said, there is a direct correlation between the uh, some of the highest intensity violence that we've been seeing and the ceasefires that have been announced. Um, and the, the curious thing about the current ceasefire is that there was a 48 hour lag time between mm -hmm. signing the agreement and it coming into effect today. And within that 48 hour window, we saw a, a serious and significant uptick in the level of fighting, which signifies that the generals, you know, on, on both SAF and the RSF side are very much- Sorry, SAF being the Sudanese build. armed forces and RSF referring to the rapid uh, support forces. Exactly. Um, that they very much think that they can will militarily win this and that they're using these ceasefires rather than to provide um, urgently needed humanitarian access, rather as a, 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 an opportunity to regroup, uh, to recruit and to uh, re resupply themselves. Um, so actually, we're not seeing, you know, um, the, the desired effect, frankly, of these ceasefires. In fact, rather the opposite. Yeah. And against this background of an intensification of, of the war in Sudan or the armed conflict, however you care to describe it, I'd like to ask um, both of you to give us uh, an, an indication of the impact this fighting is having on, on ordinary citizens, um, the civilian population of, of Sudan. Um, both of you, I think, have in, in your previous um, writings and, and comments made clear that this is really a conflict between two armed factions um, rather than one, let's say, between different um, uh, con constituencies within the country. Nevertheless, what is the impact it's, it's having on the civilian population? And Khaloud, perhaps I could start with you. Uh, you know, the impact is, is so significant, whether you are facing aerial bombardment, whether your house, uh, you know, by, by the Sudan armed forces, whether your house has been broken into and your possessions looted um, by the paramilitary rapid support forces, 
or whether you are facing um, the impact of secondary impacts of the war. For example, the fact that there are no longer the levels, uh, the right, the high level of, of, of healthcare that is found, um, um, hospitals being out of commission, students not being able to go to schools or universities, um, people facing you know, serious risks to their lives, um, the, the war economy that has sprung up and the fact that that is making fuel and basic uh, goods and necessities sky high. You know, No one has escaped the impact of this war, whether they live in Khartoum or in Darfur, the places that have seen the, the most fighting, or whether they live in other parts of the country, which to some extent have been reasonably uh, more peaceful. I think what is very clear is that no matter when this war ends, and currently it looks like it's going to be quite protracted, the effects of this war are going to be felt by a large number of people for a long period of time. Um, but as right now, there's very little focus on that and much more focus on the, the protagonists of the war. And I think that should be flipped on its head. And um, uh, Hamid, um, what do you consider the main impact that this war is having on ordinary Sudanese? Well, Khulud has summed it uh, all, but I would, I would, I would also speak about, for instance, other things in, in more details, for instance, the dis displacement uh, of people. So today, uh, the IOM have- uh, International Organization that, for uh, Migration. For migration. Mm -hmm. So this is that 1.1 million Sudanese people are displaced now, or either you know, internally within other uh, regions of the Sudan or externally. Uh, both Khulud and I left Khartoum and, you know, uh, are, are in some way displaced uh, because of the war. Uh, so can, can I interrupt is... you, um, Hamid, to ask if, if you could share with us your personal journey out of Sudan? Because we're hearing a lot about extraordinary difficulties that people seeking to flee the fighting in Sudan are, are, are facing on their journeys um, across borders. Absolutely. Uh, so the war economy that Khulud mentioned uh, has obviously a lot to do with, with, with transport and trying to leave the country. Uh, obviously, first of all, there, there are no humanitarian or so, sorry, uh, no safe uh, corridors, uh, you know, uh, arranged for people to leave if they wanted or needed to leave. Uh, the same way these were arranged for a lot of international uh, staff to evacuate and, and, and to get to safety and so on. That is not an option for Sudanese citizens. So they end up taking very risky and expensive uh, routes to get out, out of the country. Uh, none of the borders uh, are completely open. All of them come with a lot of risks and a lot of uh, logistics that a lot of people cannot afford, like paying for visas, getting visas online in some cases and paying for that through you know, online banking and, and so on. All of the things that, you know, in the day, uh, normal life of the Sudanese citizens are quite difficult uh, to have, uh, and now even in the context of war. Uh, so for the average Sudanese citizen, it's very uh, difficult, almost impossible to leave the country. Uh, for those who have the means, it's also very difficult. Uh, a lot of these uh, you know, expenses you have to pay for in cash uh, without being able to access banks, uh, mobile banking, was down for most days because of the uh, internet outage. Uh, so uh, take it, and on the way to these uh, borders, whether you're going through Egypt or Ethiopia or South Sudan, you know there are huge security concerns. Uh, a lot of a lot of people were attacked by rapid support forces uh, troops on the way, or by gangs who were trying to steal uh, their cars or uh, their belongings, uh, making use of the security vacuum. Uh, so it, it, it is very risky and, 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 and expensive. Uh, and then not to mention the humanitarian crisis at the borders uh, where people are, you know, families are being separated. For instance, when you're get, trying to cross to Egypt, uh, females are not asked to provide visas so they can uh, cross, they can the, cross. Uh, yeah. to the other side. Meanwhile, male family members uh, would... would between 16 and, and 50 years old would have to stay behind and, and try to get a visa. It's reported now that 7,000 uh, Sudanese men are waiting for visas in Halfa uh, and the embassy or the consulate- Halfa on the Sudanese Egyptian border. Close to the borders, yes. And the Egyptian consulate is uh, releasing 100 passports per, per, per day. And now it's day 37 since the war started or something like that. So. You know, after more than a month, this is not 
resolved yet. No more staff uh, have been uh, sent to the uh, consulate or so on. And then on the Ethiopian border, the situation is not very different. Uh, people have been waiting for visas and the policies keep changing every day. One day you can just get it, one day you can't get it if you don't have residence elsewhere. Uh, so it is, I mean, staying is, is, is a nightmare and leaving is a nightmare. People do not have uh, any safe options. And uh, Khulud, I, I, on, on the subject of, of refugees, we've also been hearing um, horror stories of uh, the Dutch embassy and other Western embassies basically keeping passports that had been submitted to them before the conflict erupted under lock and key, um, and then removing all their staff from the country. And I think the American embassy actually shredding all the passports it had in its possession. Um, you've left uh, Sudan as well, as I understand. Um, was was your journey very similar to um, Hamid's? And and what is the situation with people who are effective, effectively hostage in their own country because their passports have either um, been taken from them or destroyed by um, consulates or embassies to which they had been submitted to receive to obtain a visa? Well, you know, for, for those people, and, and it has to be said, it's not just the Dutch, it's the Dutch, the Swedes, um, the Americans and the French, and the Americans and the French actually shredded passports on their way out as is common policy. They didn't give, um, you know, the passport holders any chance to retrieve um, those passports. The, the New York Times had an article on this a few days ago in which they noted that the Chinese embassy had actually left a number for people to get in contact. Uh, to pick up their, their 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 passport, so clearly it is in diplomatic practice to allow for people to access their passports. I think it it shows a very callous disregard by those four embassies that they just uh, prioritize their own people and um, spared no thought for the people whose passports they had in their possession. And you know some of the very public responses from some of those um, governments has been, you know, please go to the relevant authorities and, and take out a new passport, which is of course as if possible. that's possible, yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, it's, it's, we, we're seeing a continuation, I think, of, of, of that kind of attitude uh, playing out in the response. So, you know, and, and this is actually not a surprise. I, would, I think a lot of people would not be surprised by this because, you know, when the political process that preceded this conflict was playing out and there were a lot of um, Sudanese uh, citizens, ordinary citizens, activists, civil society members who said this could all go terribly wrong. Um, they were so vehement in, in, in uh, their, you know, claims that the, around the political process and what could go wrong because they knew precisely that they would be the ones who would face um, the, the brunt of those poor decisions. Um, you know, and for me, I am very fortunate in that I am um, a, a, a British passport holder. And so my journey was eased somewhat by the fact that I had um, a UK passport and therefore was able to access a UK um, evacuation. But getting from Khartoum to Port Sudan, which is usually a very short uh, trip of 12 hours, despite the fact that Khartoum, uh, Sudan is a massive country. It took something like 30 hours. Um, mm. And it's by bus, you a sense I of presume. by bus, which gives you a sense of, you know, and there are checkpoints on the way and you didn't quite know how those checkpoints would turn out. Fortunately for me, um, you know, we were able to pass through these checkpoints, but for a lot of other people, we hear horror stories of being stopped, of being robbed and worse. Um, and people, frankly, as Hamid said, don't know which is safer, or rather, which is a better option, staying or going. It's just really an impossible decision. And and for those unable or unwilling um, to leave Sudan for Egypt or Chad or Ethiopia or or other destinations, are they generally staying put? Are they going to Khartoum? Are they trying to leave Khartoum? Um, what, what do we have an indication of? of um, those who are within Sudan, how they are seeking um, refuge and safety. And uh, perhaps to uh, ask you, uh, Khulud, again. Uh, well, we know that a lot of people um, that have tried to leave are finding it difficult to, to do so. Ticket prices have gone up for the bus, which is the safest way to go. Taking one's own private car, especially if it's a four by four that can withstand the journey um, is, is, is a risky thing to do because it's, you know, those kinds of cars are most sought after by particularly the rapid support forces um, who have been known to loot them. And Khartoum is right bank smack in the middle of Sudan. It's not near any border. Mm -hmm. And so getting to any border from Khartoum is very, very difficult. No one goes westwards because there's even, there's even more fighting in parts of Darfur than Khartoum. Going southwards is quite risky. 
um, because, you know, getting all the way to South Sudan, one might encounter uh, problems, but it seems to be so far actually one of the safest routes. As Hamid pointed out, going north to Egypt, um, which was, you know, before the conflict, re reasonably easy to do. Women had um, no visas they needed. Um, men from 16 to 50 could take one out in a day. Um, those issues have become very much more difficult um, processes now. Um, so staying is 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 fraught with danger. We're hearing of you know houses being looted. We're hearing of of all sorts of human rights abuses um, taking place. We're hearing of people being told to leave their homes, of having their possessions um, raided. I'm quite sure where I lived, which was near the airport in one of the neighborhoods of of, of Khartoum, Amarat. I'm pretty sure my place has been raided alongside our neighbors downstairs and 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 people in the streets um, around us. We hear every day of people reporting um, that their, their possessions have been taken and their homes have been broken into. And of course, if you have left Khartoum and you're in reasonable safety, you count yourself lucky that the only thing that has happened to you is essentially that your possessions have been taken. But for a lot of people, that's memories. It is their wealth, it is their, you know, um, their, their history, effectively, that is also being erased. It's a very difficult time. But nevertheless, you're saying, um, you know, if 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 you've been robbed in certain respects, you consider yourself um, uh, one of the luckier ones. And um, yeah. Hamid, if I can ask you, what are the main human rights abuses um, that that you're hearing about from um, Sudanese who remain in the country? Well, there's many, unfortunately. Uh, so. Uh, there are human rights uh, abuses by 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 both uh, you know f uh, warring uh, f factions and, and so on. But obviously, it's it's important to uh, to 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 kind of analyze who is doing what and so on. So as as institutionally, uh, staff the Sudanese armed forces are re comparatively relatively more uh, organized. They don't as individuals as an institution. Uh, you know, in an organized and institutionalized way, commit a lot of human rights violations. On the other hand, the Iraqi support forces, uh, parliamentary days, it, it's not really a proper institution. So there aren't really uh, proper ways of following up and, and so on. Uh, but we have heard uh, and, and confirmed, uh, you know, reports of abuses by, by, by both uh, factions. Uh, so we're hearing of uh, so many things like, Hulud said, uh, raiding people's property, uh, stealing their, their, their properties and, and, and so on. In so many cases, using people's houses as, you know, uh, basis for, for the troops. Uh, my house was used by the rap support forces uh, for, for over 10 days and then they left and got stationed uh, somewhere else. Uh, so so th that is one of the things that we have been seeing all over the place. And then once they are in these residential uh, neighborhoods and so on, you get all of the other uh, reports uh, that are associated with, you know, soldiers who are, uh, you know, uh, careless and cannot be controlled and don't have any uh, accountability mechanisms uh, do. Uh, like I, I said, uh, the, the stealing uh, people's belongings, and robbery, and so on. But there are so many cases uh, that are confirmed of rape uh, of women and men, and in, in so many uh, areas. Uh, and it's it's being documented uh, for when there's a possibility uh, to access justice and and, and accountability. Uh, and then, obviously, all other sorts of uh, war crimes, for instance shelling residential uh, neighborhoods uh, where people are residing and, and are getting literally bombed and airstriked and, 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 and so and on. If I can interrupt you, this is a case of civilians being caught in the middle rather than civilians being targeted by one or the other faction? Yeah, no, it, it is uh, civilians being uh, cro uh, you know caught in the crossfire uh, in the midst of this, uh, but still, uh, you know, the forces, uh, when airstrikes, obviously, I would be speaking about the Sudanese armed forces, they would shell a specific, uh, you know, neighborhood because there is uh, RSF presence there. And shelling that presumably. presumably. Exactly. And, you know, if, if, if you try to look at, you know, what, what are the losses, what is the collateral damage and what is the real damage, it, it ends up rapid support forces being the collateral damage. The main damage is the, the right. citizens, their property and, and their lives. 
I'd like to make a comment on that actually, Please. because while I think the shelling is, um, is has been indiscriminate, um, you know, we're also seeing both sides target uh, civil society members. We've seen them target doctors and um, journalists. They they are the two professions that have uh, elected representatives in their unions. We're seeing them target neighborhood resistance committees, which are and, and um, Hello, these are yeah. these are groups that had been particularly active in and. Yes promoting um, a democratic transition in the past several exactly, years. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And because they have been key in promoting the democratic transition, they have been targeted by both sides um, in, in terms of kidnappings, in terms of forced detentions. There are a lot of missing people um, who have been looked for and, and haven't been found, some of them from the early days of, of the conflict. And to me, this indicates that we have two wars going on um, simultaneously. One war is between the two factions, the two military factions of Sudan Armed Forces and the RSF. And the other war is between the two of them against civil society, against civilian life in, 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 in Sudan, particularly in Khartoum, which yeah. they both seek to destroy um, because they're thinking about what the, the, the Sudan that they will win uh, effectively uh, will look like and trying to minimize the challenges they will have in that scenario. Yeah. And, and, and if, please go ahead, uh, Hamid. Yeah, if, if I just may add a very quick point, because this is a very important uh, point that, that Hulud just mentioned, and something that is related to what you mentioned earlier about, you know, how we both previously described this as a war between two army factions, uh, and the Sudanese people, you know, are, are not part of this or have no, have no stake at this. They're just, they're, they're, they're losing uh, everything because of it, but they're not active parts of it. Uh, and what these both both factors are trying to do uh, by you know uh, targeting specific groups uh, and, and and detaining specific groups and so on, they are basically trying to uh, target whoever is is is. So there's there's a there's a popular campaign that said said you know basically mobilizing against war and saying no not to war. And and if you are part of that, if you are not taking sides. You are being you get pushed by both by, by both uh, factions to, to take a side uh, and, and and to suggest you know get labeled as an RSF supporter or as a SAF supporter and and so on and and the danger of this is a the human rights violations that we're currently seeing and so on but it gets to a point where it pushes different uh, you know uh, components of the society to become more active in this world and not you neutrality know, is being actively targeted. Um, exactly. and, and I think both of you have, have, have just reminded us that um, um, these two warring factions, or at least their leaders, um, General Burhan and of, of the Sudanese Armed Forces and General Hamedti of the Rapid Support Forces, um, initially developed a partnership precisely to obstruct and prevent um, Sudan's transition to democracy after its um, popular revolution to oust um, the long-term uh, autocrat, Omar al-Bashir. And now um, uh, they're at war with each other, which leads me to my next question um, about their agendas. Um, do their agendas extend beyond the struggle for supremacy and control of Sudan? Um, do they represent significant domestic constituencies? Um, or are they basically clones of each other in, in, in fighting over who gets to prevent the transition, if you will? And Khulud, if I could perhaps start with you. Sure. I, I think at this point, it's worth um, reminding everyone that the RSF in its current form was created by the Sudan Armed Forces. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why it's, it's helpful to think of this as a war between two factions of the same military project rather than two distinct uh, um, militaries or two distinct armies. And given that they are part of the same military project, we can trace their origins in, in this um, enterprise that was around seeking control over Sudan's resources, um, particularly in this case, um, gold, but also other resources, land, agricultural goods, etc. But for them, you know, it, it extends beyond that. Holding the levers of power and holding the keys to the kingdom, as it were, also in, enables them to strike the kinds of international bargains and to have the kinds of international policies that will help them remain in power. And we have seen 
the generals do that both together and separately. And when we start seeing them, you know, sort of cultivate their own uh, and very different um, foreign policies, when we see them, when we saw them start having very different income streams that are not dependent on each other, once we saw them try to cultivate different political constituencies, that was when the writing was really on the wall, that the, the, the sort of convenient marriage between these two generals was on the rocks and that they were heading towards a confrontation. And what is clear for, 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 to see now is that whomever wins uh, will be leaning very heavily on those income streams and on those foreign policies and on those constituencies to try and gain an advantage over the other. I think the thing that they're both missing is that actually there's no military advantage here and the international community is quite fickle. They will you know, learn to live with whomever the victor is perhaps, but because Sudan's revolution is one of consciousness more than one of just simply removing you know, a, te a, technocrat, a dictator or an autocrat, it's much more about underpicking uh, or picking out um, uh, you know, the, the very pillars of Bashir's military and, and political projects. And because that has been in the, in the works now for four years, it's very difficult for whomever might win this. And I, for me, there is no winning for either general, but there is no military win here that can override the, the democratic push that most people in Sudan have been longing for. So I think they they've made many miscalculations. And Hamid, is, is that um, a conclusion or an assessment um, you agree with? And do you also see this as um, becoming a protracted fight to the death between these two generals? Yes, I would absolutely agree. But I think we should also be uh, very careful and keep you know our eyes open that as as soon as they, I think they're already starting to realize it, but they would come a point where they clearly see that none of them is 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 winning this in in any way, and then they would try to find their way back to a political process uh, and 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 to get back to the old tired arrangements uh, that that they were granted previously, uh, mainly under the influence of the international community who suggested that you know these generals are good partners to work with and are you know could be trusted. Uh, and you're so it's, speaking it's very, here mainly about uh, regional and and Western powers. Absolutely, as yes. regional and Western powers and international organizations like the UN. Uh, so, so, so there has been a suggestion that both genders are can should be trusted and are good partners and are both interested in the democratization process and and so on. And there's a danger that you know as soon as they realize that this is you know is not working for either of them to go and find their way back through a political process uh, and go back to the security sector reform agenda and, 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 and all of that. And, and it's very important to pay you know, attention to this because I feel that it could be marketed as a solution very soon uh, to save lives of these people and, and so on. And we go back to the same process as if nothing has happened. And and speaking of um, proceeding as if nothing has happened, um, yesterday we had, um, I believe, the seventh um, ceasefire agreement, another agreement in Jeddah, this time signed by representatives of the two uh, warring factions. Um, you you had indicated some skepticism about this um, uh, earlier, but perhaps it also gives us an opportunity to discuss both whether these various ceasefire plans are in any way realistic and effective. And secondly, it's also, I think, um, an opportunity to discuss uh, the involvement of, of regional and foreign powers. Hamid, if I could please start with you. Well, I think, you know, having, you know, I don't think we can call them peace talks yet, but having talks in, in Jeddah or, or wherever, uh, is not a bad idea. I think it's uh, as uh, the, the war is, you know, continuing in its uh, ugliest, uh, in the ugliest way possible, and so on. So whatever 
form or shape of talks, I wouldn't say no to it uh, at this point. However, I think it's important to look at what's on the table and the agenda that's being discussed uh, and, and, and who is saying what and who is, and, 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 and to just think about, you know, why are these actors uh, in these rooms uh, to begin with? Uh, I think none of the, none of them, like the Iraqi support forces or the Sunnis armed forces are currently in these uh, rooms or engaging these talks because they're genuine about it. They're both trying to, uh, you know, please uh, regional international actors and kind of uh, calm their anxieties. Meanwhile, they continue to find, fight and try to, you know, have a quick win, although it's it's so, so quick anymore, but have a quick win. And, and then they would come back to the stock uh, with, with, with higher negotiating uh, positions and, and, and so on. So that's very important uh, to, to keep in mind when we think about what's, what's, what are we getting You're basically after. saying when, when, when um, the Saudis invite you to ceasefire talks, you don't say no, whether you intend to respect the result or not. Well, yes, this is what they're currently doing, the way that the Saudis and the US are, say, are inviting them to blocks and they can't say no. Uh, in fact, they wouldn't want to say no. It's, it's good for them to say yes and go there and procrastinate and discuss all sorts of things that are not, uh, not, not useful. I mean, these talks have been going on for, for weeks now and they're only discussing ceasefire now. They, in the, initially, they were discussing how to conduct war according to international human rights uh, international humanitarian law, which I, this is not Sounds nothing a bit that surreal. you need to Exactly. So this mm. is nothing that you needed to discuss anyway. And this was what was the first agreement was about uh, when it was signed. It was about literally how to conduct war according to international uh, humanitarian law. Uh, and now they uh, signed this ceasefire thing uh, two days ago. It sh should go... Uh, you know, start in a couple of, in an hour, I think, or so, any, any, any time now. Uh, and I don't, you know, I I would love to be proved wrong, but I will. I don't see it hold, uh, holding. I don't think it would, it would hold. They would still, still continue to, to violate it. Uh, but I think that the design of the process and the agenda being discussed uh, is problematic, but it also shows that the international community have not used its leverage yet. Uh, and I wonder why, uh, you know, after all this time, uh, they, they have, they're not taking the CAC yet because both, both, both uh, warring uh, factions have direct linkages with regional, uh, regional powers and the international community and the US specifically has a lot of leverage over, uh, over these uh, allies and so on, but that has not been used in a serious way uh, yet. Uh, the, the executive order, for instance, from the president of the United States about uh, sanctions, uh, targeted sanctions and so on, still sounds like a hot air. Nothing has been materialized, it's not being taken seriously. And even when they sign these deals about the ceasefire or the previous one and so on, there are no uh, accountability, there are no monitoring, monitoring uh, mechanisms uh, to begin with, and then there are no accountability mechanisms uh, if, if any of them uh, violates these, these agreements. And, and Khulud, it, it sounds as if um, it will require some level of international, regional and international intervention to end this war, but at the same time that it appears entirely unrealistic to expect any of the foreign parties um, to actually deploy their leverage for the benefit of the Sudanese people. Absolutely. I mean, this isn't um, this isn't new. Where we are seeing the same behaviors, the same attitudes, and the same logics that we saw guide the political process um, before the conflict, that in many ways actually led us to this conflict now playing out in the mediation. So it's not surprising that we are seeing the same results, effectively that the desired effect is not met. I think what the mediators failed to realize is that these negotiations in Jeddah are for the Sudan armed forces and the rapid support forces, simply another front for this conflict. There is a front that is being, you know, there's the battlefront on the ground that is being fought in Khartoum and Darfur and other parts of the country. There's the, another front is the info wars that are being, you know, fought out mostly on Arabic language news channels and um, on social media. And then there's a third front that has opened up, which is the Jeddah um, negotiations. We can see from both camps that they have sent 
hardliners um, that will be able to showcase the, the position, um, the hardline position of um, both the sides. But these aren't people that have any control or any power to force an implementation of whatever is agreed in Jeddah. Um, and, on, and on top of that, they are the, you know, the, they are there effectively to curry favor with the mediators, with the Americans, with, with the Saudis, in order to say later on, when there is a political process which they must um, engage with, that they did the right thing, that they signed a ceasefire agreement, that they signed an agreement on international humanitarian law, which by the way, they should be respecting anyway. So these are all tactical moves by both SAF and the RSF, tactical moves, by the way, that have been uh, very much lifted from the Omar al-Bashir playbook. And Omar al-Bashir was able to stay in power for 30 years, precisely because he knew exactly how to play the international community. And he knew how to play the international community also against each other. And so we see while we have delegations of both SAF and the RSF in Jeddah, they are both sending envoys and emissaries to Cairo, to Juba, to Injimena, to neighboring countries to press for their positions there in case other fora of, of mediation were to open up, therefore playing one mediation platform against the other. And that way they get to keep the advantage whilst also um, showing that they are you know, willing to play ball, willing to, be, um, to come to mediation tables without ever signing any agreement that they are actually willing to implement. It's a very smart game. And my fear is that the mediators in Jeddah, the Americans and the Saudis, either they don't know that this is the game that is being played, which would be bad enough, or that they do know it and yet have run out of options. And frankly, if they have run out of options, it's because they're unwilling to entertain a new way of doing this. There have been no civilians that are part of any of these discussions and they are central to making any agreement have any sort of legitimacy. And, and on, on that point, um, uh, Khulud, we've spoken a bit about the targeting of, of civil society and um, those who have been advocating for a democratic transition, um, them being targeted by both factions. But more broadly, what is the position of Sudanese civil society forces and activists? And how has this crisis affected um, their agenda? and their ability to advocate for their um, agenda of a transition to um, uh, civilian rule? Well, you know, a, a lot of civil society, a lot of the resistance committees and neighborhood resistance committees are engaged in meeting the humanitarian response on the ground right now. But they are also working at compiling a political uh, statement. And as Hamid said, they have already started to do so with this no to war platform. Um, and within that no to war platform, it's very clear that they, that they back neither general, that they have chosen neutrality as their political position. That is not a political position that either side in this conflict respects. It is not a political position thus far that has won them a seat at the mediations and it very much should. We have a very rich history um, of civic uh, political engagement in Sudan, and that has led to a very wide variety of political actors from different parts of the political spectrum. Now, previously, mediators had said that there needs to be absolute unity and coherence within Sudan's um, civilian groups in order to be taken seriously um, during political uh, negotiations. Um, it, that wasn't true then, and it certainly isn't true now. What binds them all is that they don't want war to continue in their country. Beyond that, they don't need to have the same political objectives. They just, you know, they need to have platforms available so that they're able to come together and create the mechanisms that will lead them to, uh, to peace and then to discuss um, what will happen uh, politically to get Sudan's political transition restarted. I think what this war has done is show unequivocally that neither general, neither you know, entity, neither faction of the armed forces can be trusted to usher in a civilian, demo civilian democratic rule in Sudan, and therefore they cannot be part of the solution. That is, you know, um, something that inexplicably was still up for debate before this conflict broke out. So now civilian pro-democracy groups can point to this war and say very clearly, we told you these generals were not good faith actors. We told you they could not shepherd in the kind of civilian democracy, democracy that would make Sudan stable. We told you that their very presence would bring about instability, not just in Sudan, but in the region. I would hope that this war would show everybody now 
um, how right they were and frankly earn them that very much deserved spot in mediation conversations and in um, political talks in general. And Hamid, um, beyond being proven correct, um, how has this war affected the, the um, concrete ability of resistance committees and, and professional associations and, and other civil society um, uh, forces to continue pushing for this transition to civilian rule because it clearly hasn't um, empowered them more to do so. And, and you've pointed out they're even being targeted and killed. Well, obviously, since the war started on the 15th of, of, of April, uh, the, the conflict itself uh, playing out on ground has uh, killed uh, civil politics in, in, in so many ways. Uh, but this is being now exacerbated by a political, well, not a, a process or talks in Jeddah that do not, you know, take civilians uh, into account, uh, even, you know, uh, making the problem bigger uh, for civilians or for civil society groups in terms of uh, to find platforms uh, through which they could advocate uh, for, 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 for restoring Sudan's democracy. Or but can I just on... ask you, are, are they basically being entirely diverted by the understandable priority of dealing with the humanitarian um, emergencies and, and, and the efforts to bring an end to this armed conflict, or are they still able um, to promote their previous agendas? Well, if, if, if you have learned anything from Sudan's uh, transition so far the past four years, is that resistance committees and Sudan's civil society are able to juggle so many things at the same time. They are able to work on so many, uh, you know, files and agenda, and, and they're able to protest at the same time, write a political declaration and at the same time, respond to the pandemic at the same time. So many things at the same time. The ones who aren't able to do the same thing are traditional political uh, parties and so on, and the international community, to be very frank. And with all the resources that the international community has, uh, I, it's, it's, it's disappointing, but it's, I, I think it's also shameful that they are not able to do multiple things at the same time uh, and this shows you how they're not paying enough attention uh, to Sudan and, and to the crisis uh, or the crises that Sudan has been uh, going through. Uh, so I think yes they are responding to the uh, humanitarian uh, crisis on ground way before any international organization started providing any support uh, to any Sudanese citizens uh, on ground. But there have also been, uh, you know, as part of the platform that we spoke about, the No to War platform, uh, voicing of their opinions, and also making sure that whatever, you know, uh, political process that might start uh, after, after ending the ongoing conflict would not dis dismiss the democratization uh, agenda and would not focus only on you know, stability and security and, and, and so on, and kind of suggest that the war that just broke out kind of ends whatever prospects uh, for, Sudan, uh, for democracy that Sudan has. So they have been active uh, in, 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 you know, in parallel to being involved to, in the humanitarian response. And, Mike, and can why, I just make a point? Yes, please do. You know, Hamid said that um, the, the war sort of um, killed uh, civilian politics. And, and I would agree with him, but I think we need to make a distinction that the war has killed elite level civilian politics, which is that which was so tied up with the political process that preceded and in many ways precipitated this conflict. Politics that is happening um, elsewhere, that is happening in uh, non, you know, very non sort of non traditional, historically traditional elite um, spaces and in, within resistance committees, within unions, et cetera. That continues and, and actually very much um, uh, has sort of kicked up a gear in terms of recognizing this as an opportunity to reset um, some of the things that had gone awry when, frankly, um, a lot of people relied on the uh, elite politics to see them through. So I think we need to distinguish between those two levels of political uh, mobilization and organization and recognize how the war affects them very differently. Yeah. Um um, finally, I'd, I'd like to ask each of you um, your prognosis and also your aspirations for Sudan in the coming period. Um, you've spoken of your fears of a protracted conflict and your hopes um, 
for a re-energized um, transition to civilian rule, perhaps this time with um, with support from the international community. Uh, Hamid, if I could begin with you. Well, uh, I think my, my very uh, immediate uh, aspirations for Sudan is to, the, to see an end to this war today, uh, like this very moment, uh, seeing how much we have lost uh, because of the two generals deciding to uh, fight each other in the midst of residential areas uh, is something that is uh, heartbreaking on so many levels. And, it's, I, and we just need to see an end to that uh, immediately. Uh, and, and, and that is the number one priority. Uh, I think for me and for uh, most other actors, but that should not, uh, you know, stop us. Like I said uh, previously, uh, we shouldn't allow this to, uh, you know, divert us or, or, or shouldn't allow us to make us uh, allow this to make us forget about the democratization agenda. If 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 anything, this war proves that everything that pro democracy activists and actors have been mobilizing for and advocating since day one, since the first day of this transition, is 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 that it's right. And I think, you know, should this war end today and we start a, a political process tomorrow, I think it should take us three days uh, to 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 come to the end because we have all the answers, everything that people have tried to uh, debate and say, well, it's not safe to exclude the military from politics. Uh, it's not safe to do this. It's not safe to do that. We have seen the worst of the worst case uh, scenario and the worst case scenario uh, play out now. So there's nothing, you know, that should stop us from, from, from taking on board everything that uh, pro-democracy uh, groups have been advocating and, you know, all the other debates or other, uh, narratives uh, or arguments have been proved wrong uh, at a very high cost, unfortunately, but they have been proved wrong now. So I think there's nothing else to discuss uh, previously, uh, basically. So yeah, I hope that, that the war would end very soon. And then when we get to a political process, we would, you know, we would not start all the way from the beginning and try to prove what has already been proven uh, all, 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 all over again. Um, Khulud, finally, over to you, but also to ask you, is a protracted armed conflict um, the most likely scenario, despite the hopes and aspirations that Hamid um, has, has just um, enumerated? Is, is Sudan fated to go the way of Yemen, of Lebanon, of, of Libya, of Syria, of Iraq? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, every country has its own trajectory. So um, I and, and the problem, one of the issues with Sudan is that it's so large that we might see one type of scenario, for example, in Darfur and another scenario play out in other parts of the country. Um, we've seen this already. Um, Sorry, but uh, to interrupt you, but are, are we, is, is the disintegration of, of Sudan as a state also on the agenda? It's fragmentation. So two things there, you know, you asked a question about the, the, how protracted this could be. Sudan yeah. has never had a conflict that isn't protracted. So historically, that doesn't help. Historically, also, Sudan is, um, you know, birthed the, the, the world's youngest country. And so we have a history, a very recent history of regional uh, secession. Um, and this could exacerbate the conversations um, uh, that, are be, that are happening in some parts of the country around secession. But I think there is still enough um, and in, in many ways, this war has been an equalizer. There are parts of the country that have seen a war um, for decades. Um, you know, the Nuba Mountains, Blue Nile, parts of Darfur, the East. Um, this is the first time in over 100 years that the state has fought a war in Khartoum. Um, and in many ways, the whole country now, you know, has this sort of understanding of what is at stake. Um, and, and more importantly, how badly uh, the previous political project that was playing out in Sudan, very centralized, autocratic, militarized state, how that plays out. So I think now we can see a much more wholehearted, much more comprehensive rejection of that political 
project and making space for something new because now we all understand what is you know frankly what's at stake and how bad it could be so given that we're probably likely to see some kind of protracted conflict you know the, the, there are dangers associated with that which is that sudan's neighbors of which there are seven who aren't already engaged in the conflict i'm thinking here of um, of Egypt, of um, the Haftar um, LNA Libya, um, yeah. government in Libya, and um, the Central African Repub uh, Republic government also. They are already have, have been documented to be involved. We could see other um, neighbors, for example, Ethiopia, Chad, and South Sudan, who currently have chosen neutrality, feel that they have to pick a side. And if that becomes the case, then we could see this conflict becoming even more protracted. Right now, there is no proxy um, war happening. We could see this increasingly having proxy-like characteristics. Like, you know, like a DRC, in effect. I mean, potentially. Again, the, the DRC has its own sort of political logics at play, but we could see similar characteristics playing out in Khartoum mm -hmm. uh, in, and, in, and in parts of Sudan. Hamid earlier said that this is the worst case scenario. You know, before this conflict broke out, this kind of scenario was the worst case scenario. Now, we have a new worst case scenario, which is that no longer this would be a, a battle of two factions fought over civilian settings, urban settings, capital cities, etc. But it would be a fully fledged civil war where ordinary citizens are forced to pick a side, either because they have bought into the narrative of either side or because there is such a breakdown of law and order. There's such a break, uh, an increase in lawlessness that they feel they have to pick up arms to defend themselves and their communities and thereby getting embroiled in the conflict. And that kind of all out civil war is something that should be avoided at all costs. So while this is has all the makings of a protracted conflict as we've seen in other parts of the country, it's imperative that it is, you know, that that is mitigated as much as possible. So we don't get that civil war that scenario. That would be much more difficult to put an end to. So it's, it's imperative to prevent the scenario of a protracted, civil war that also becomes a regional and international uh, proxy war. Um, Khulud Khair and Hamid Khalafallah, I'd like to thank you for sharing your expertise, your experiences, and your insights uh, with connections. It's been a fascinating uh, discussion, and we can only hope the very best for Sudan in the period to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike. Thank you.